well. It's 11 p.m. UTC, so I believe we can start the course. Um, I would like to welcome everyone. I uh, hope everyone is doing well and taking care during these troubling times. My name is Pedro Lana. Uh, I'm part of the organizing committee of this open course, and I will be moderating this webinar and passing on some relevant info. Any questions you have about the course, please type them in the chat so I can answer one at a time. However, questions about internet governance can be made directly to Tracy after he finishes his exposition. Uh, youth like IGF usually have a fellowship program before the event. Because this year the main event is going to be online, we have changed the format of this training process to make it more open and available for more people. Every module have a preparation phase, which is composed mostly by readings, and a webinar phase with a selected speaker, speaker known for his good work at internet governance. Tracy, for example, is an extremely active member of this ecosystem, having mentored and trained a large, a large number of people, myself included. Uh, during this preparation phase, most modules will have some slides and small quizzes that are part of the course Shaping the Internet, History and Future, gently provided to us by the Internet Society e learning staff, to whom we are grateful for the support. Um, there will be certificates of participation emitted by the Youth Observatory and the Internet Society available to those that complete the open course. But to achieve that, you must register at the Internet Society e learning platform so I can add you to the Youth Black, Black IJF open course, and then complete the given tasks, uh, the given tasks, which generally consists on short reading, short, short readings. If you are not able to access the platform, please contact me, mentioning the username you registered. To avoid taking more, more of your time, I'll pass the word to Trace Hawkshaw, but before, I will introduce him shortly and send the full bio on the chat. Chris Hawkshaw is an ICT and digital economy strategist, possessing close to 25 years of local, regional, and international experience, spanning work in the public and private sectors, where he has been integrally involved in the design and implementation of several globally recognized award-winning initiatives. Tracy has represented Trinidad and Tobago in various international forums and was appointed to several national committees task force and leadership roles at the Ministries of Science and Technology, while also being founding vice chair, vice chair of Internet Society during that and Tobago chapter, and elected its chair for the 2017 and 2019 term. He served a two-year term as vice chair of ICANN Governmental Advisory Committee, co-coordinated the dynamic coalition on small island developing states in the internet economy at the United Nations Internet Governance Forum, and was selected twice to be the Latin American, uh, the Latin American and Caribbean Regional at Large member of the 2019 ICANN Nominating Committee. Tracy is also a member of the Teaching and Research Faculty at Dipole Foundation at the University of Malta and works in leadership positions in several organizations in the private sector. We are happy that he could be part of this course and share his vast knowledge with us. Thanks, Tracy. Your, your turn. Hi, how are you? Um, can you everybody hear me okay? Yes? All right. Um, I believe my connection is unstable. Pedro, I think you may, you may gonna have to call me at some point too. Um, okay. I'm getting a lot of uh, drops on when I heard you speak, so that's, uh, um, to be challenging, so I'll just let you know how it's going. But it looks like it might be unstable. I'm going to switch off my video. Hi, everyone, to save some bandwidth, and uh, we can start now. Okay, so hello, everyone. So, my name, as Pedro indicated, is Tracy Hackshaw. I have done, I guess, quite a bit of training with the Internet Society's youth programs. Um, so, as, as Pedro indicated, I did um, train both Pedro and Eileen and several others. We've been to IGFs together, um, so it's good to see another crop of people coming in. Thank you so much. And today we're going to do a very basic introduction to internet governance. 
and the internet governance ecosystem. And I'm going to ask if you don't understand, because I know some of you may not be native English speakers, you can tell me to slow down, or you can tell you can you know put something in the chat so I could um, understand if you're understanding my English. Um, and I'm going to speak as slowly as I possibly can so that everybody can sort of understand the, the tenor of my language. So hello everyone and thank you for slide one. Thank you, Pedro. So the first slide, exactly what is internet governance? Um, in, my, in this slide, I've actually indicated to you that there's a very simple definition that I like to use, which is the one in bold. It simply refers to the processes that impact how the internet is managed. That's what I like to say as, as a definition. So it's, uh, it's, you know, there's a lot of definitions around. You may have read other definitions, but I like to use this one because it's quite straightforward and it, it kind of summarizes exactly what internet governance is. However, there's an official definition. Um, so, as you see on this particular slide, the United Nations Working Group in, on Internet Governance in 2005 defined the top, the concept as the development and applications by governments, the private sector, and civil society, and this is another, there's a very important part here, in their respective roles of shared principles, norms, rules, decision-making procedures, and programs that shape the evolution and use of the internet. Now that's a long mouthful. But what I want you to look at carefully here is the the concept that there are multiple players and multiple what we call stakeholders involved in this. And we'll get into that a little bit later in the, in the presentation. And the other particular point here is that it's in their respective roles, which means that <coughs> sorry, the, the actors or the stakeholders are all participating, representing the voices of their particular stakeholder group. So when governments participate in internet governance um, discussions, they represent government. And further to that, they generally represent the country that they are a part of, which is extremely important because as many of you are aware, each country may have a different view of how the internet is used, how it's regulated, um, you know, and, and there, you know, there are many cases which I guess we won't go into today of governments who may see the internet as being a negative um, tool, and we hear about internet shutdowns, etc. And the other governments who see the internet as being a positive tool, to a large extent, um, giving voice to many, many actors within their country, freedom of expression, and so on. So if you look at this government specifically, just even that group, and I suppose there are 200 plus countries in the world, that alone tells you the complexity of the internet governance landscape. The private sector, I mean, you're talking here about everybody from you know, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, the usual suspects straight down to your, your construction companies, your um, people who are doing, selling, um, in your own country, selling food, who are involved in other private sector activities, you know, buying um, masks, et cetera, insurance, you name it. And civil society, which is literally everybody else. So as a user, we, 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 we classify civil society there. In this definition, it also includes academia and the technical community, although that's broken up later on, and you'll see a slide on that later on. 
Um, and so if you're a student in school, um, or if you're a lecturer in a university, you can play a different role there. Um, but what's important, I think, for all of us to understand is that we are all users of the internet. Everyone is a user. Everyone here on this call tonight uses the internet in whatever form they, they, they see fit. If you're a student, if you're a professional working somewhere, if you're a government official, you're a user of the internet. And the general idea is that we're all working together to ensure that the internet is, on the one hand, open and interoperable, secure and stable, as well as useful for everyone. Next slide. Next slide, Pedro. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there you go. Next slide. Hello. Hello, yeah. hello. It's, it's there. It was just lagging a bit. All right, great. Uh, so what I want to do now is to ask, I'm going to do up two polls. Pedro, can you bring up the first poll? And yeah. let's see what you think about the first question. First question is, do you think internet governance is the same thing as governance regulating the internet? So Pedro, can you um, bring the first poll? It's launched. All right. And I would like all of you to answer that question and let's see uh, what you think about that. The first question. Is everyone seeing the poll? I'm not seeing any questions on the poll, Pedro. Yeah, they are voting. Almost all of them have already done it. I'm ending the poll now. Okay. Do we have everyone in there, Pedro, I think? And sharing the right. Okay. Let's see what it looks like. All right. So fortunately, I can't see the results because for some, you know, for some reason, my Chromebook yeah. Lectures on things like this with Zoom. <coughs> Pedro, can you? I can't see the results. So, uh, Pedro, can you help start. me understand what the. Like? Yeah, yeah. Uh, of 13 votes, 12 voted no and one voted yes. No one voted not sure. All right. So, the, the question of whether governments equal internet government governance is something that I found to be extremely interesting because I think in the Spanish language, governance, the word governance itself means government. I think that's an important point that um, language has a, a very interesting role to play with this whole concept of internet governance. So the people who said no, um, you're right, it does not mean equal to governments regulating the internet. The person who said yes is also right in a way because just a second, a role in regulating the internet. Yeah, hey, you lagged for a bit, but it's back on. Okay, so I think I'm a few minutes what I said. So I was saying that the um, person who said yes actually is not incorrect as well because that individual is, is, is accurate in a way in so much to the extent that governments themselves can regulate the internet as part of this whole internet governance landscape. So the question of whether governments internet regulate the internet as part of the government is yes, but it's not the same thing. So it doesn't equal or doesn't equate to Governments regulating the internet. So I just want to make sure we understand that. So internet governance is not equal to governments regulating the internet. So I'll make sure we clarify that. So the next the next poll, Pedro, is internet governance the same as um, what we call in English language information and communications technology government governance? You might know as IT governance or even digital governance. So is it the same thing? Let me see what people are saying to this. Do we have um, people voting, Pedro? I can't, yeah, slug yeah. In. I can't see the, the, yes. the voting. 
Uh, I will just wait for 20 more seconds until everybody can vote. There we go. Um, this time, uh, there were two people that voted on yes, eight people that voted on no, and one people that voted in not sure. All right, the not sure place, and I like that because it's that's a good that's a good it's a good response. Mm -hmm. So this, the answer to this question is that it depends. <laughs> um, so it depends on where you um, study this topic or or who teaches it. They may say it's actually the same thing. Um, however, in reality, um, internet governance from the standpoint of its global nature, its multi-stakeholder nature, and its very policy, and when I say policy, I mean not just policy like an IT policy, for those who do IT or ICT as a, as a, as a discipline, policy in terms of public interest, so state and government policy, so for example, internet governance will encompass something like the issue of is access to the internet a human right? That's a policy thought that you would not find in an IT or ICT governance discussion. ICT governance would be you know, within your organization, how it's structured, how you deal with um, complaints, how you deal with procurement and the whole organizational aspect of ICT governance and IT governance. Internet governance takes a whole different view and it's largely based on issues surrounding policy, both from a technical point of view and from a public interest point of view. So to a large extent, it is not the same as ICT governance. Some may say, it's part of it, and some may say it's very different to it, but the, the short answer is when you actually look at what it, what it entails, what it means, it's very difficult to say that it's, it's the same as. All right, so next slide, Pedro. Yeah. Any questions, any thoughts so far? Anybody has any, any, any queries about this particular? This is the the foundation of it, so I want to make sure we all understand this part of it. Does anyone have any questions or wants to say something at this point? Okay, I'm not seeing any, nothing in the chat. I'm not seeing any hands up either. Okay, so, so the reason why internet governance, so this is directly from the first, um, the slide before, why it's, it's so different to ICT governance and IT governance is pretty much this. So as you can see in this, this is a Diplo Foundation uh, cartoon that's become very famous. It's this building that consists of many levels and many floors. Um, some of, some, they're not necessarily equal to each other. Um, but in the concept of internet governance, we have to examine all of these criteria. So you see on the left-hand side, there's a board that is, um, right, I can't hear something happening. There's a board that is telling you about all of various concepts in internet governance and ICT, et cetera, on the, the whiteboard. And then on the bottom floor, you're seeing a whole other list of concepts. And then there's the floors, legal, cybersecurity, development is also based on social, economic, um, cultural, um, human rights, etc. All of these concepts, all of these aspects play a fundamental role in internet governance. There's a question from Caroline. Uh, is compliance upon internet governance? I, I would like to... Um, Ask you to clarify the question a little more compliance in terms of what, Caroline? Um, just let this, this get, get clarify further in the chat, would be grateful. I'll try and answer it. Right, so in internet governance, we have to accommodate all of these, all of these thought processes 
And by this, you see how complex it becomes. And when all of the actors and all of the players were involved, you can begin to see that each of these levels or flows or baskets in itself becomes a study in itself. So when we look at internet governance and how we are to, as an example, um, talk about access and accessibility. So for access, we talk about people getting access in different parts of the world, you know? That access can be whether it comes through undersea cables, satellite, um, mobile, you know, and the whole 5G discussion we're having now. It can be a discussion on whether people who have access or people who don't have access. In other words, because I have a certain level of, of you know, status in society, I have a, a job, I have I'll be able to buy things, I can get better access than perhaps a colleague who may be less able to, or because someone's living in a different part of the, your country. So providers provide better access to cities and towns, but maybe not to villages or rural areas. That's a whole discussion in internet governance that, although it's, it's sort of finished, and I'm using quotes, you can't see me using it here, but I'm using air quotes here, in countries like the United States maybe and the, and the European Union, and the rest of the world in, in Africa and Latin America, and the Caribbean, the Pacific Islands, um, Southeast Asia, most of Asia actually, the discussion continues about getting access to people who don't have access. As you may or may not have heard, the um, internet has only still reached five, um, half the world, 50% or thereabouts. So we still have to connect the next 50% or the next, depending on what measure you use, three or four billion people. So it's still far, far away away. And we have a whole other discussion about accessibility, persons with disabilities and getting access. Uh, women and girls and, and so on and so forth. So that, just from that standpoint alone, you can see how complex the discussion is. And that's just talking about one aspect of the development basket, which is access and inclusion, literal inclusion. Far less legal and human rights and all the things of freedom of expression. We have net neutrality and the whole gamut of, of concepts and, and thought processes. So. This is just to say that this topic is extremely complex and it's extremely important that we all understand it as being complex. There are technical aspects of it, as you see by the infrastructure and standardization basket, which is the foundation layer, and the cybersecurity layer, which is also somewhat technical, although there are other non-technical aspects about it. Um, but everything else is extremely complex. And a question coming in from Lucas, I'm seeing in the chat, it's a very good question. Why are human rights detached from legal? Because again, the complexity of the internet governance landscape is such that human rights is not necessarily a legal issue. So let me, give, let, let me, let me explain what I mean by that. If you are talking about regulating the internet and talking about allowing certain types of ISPs or or it to to function in a landscape and you need to do government policy for that and to provide certain legislative environments for that, that is considered to be legal. Where the line is blurred, and, and you're right you know, in, in talking about it, why is it detached and understanding that, that difference? The Brazilian example is, is a very good example of Marco Civil, where they utilized legal, a legal instrument to bring the human rights issue to the fore in Brazil. Other countries have also um, done similar things. But the aspect of human rights may not necessarily 
be a legal issue. So it may be a, an issue about development or social. So it may not be legislated by the government. And I don't want to see the difference. There's, there's a very, there's, there's a nuance there that in some countries, the question of whether you have, as an example, um, freedom of expression is not something that is a legal issue. It is perhaps more of a access issue or it's a development issue or it's a cultural issue. So the separation of legal from human rights is important because while you can use legal concepts or legal instruments to enforce or to improve the human rights uh, aspects of internet governance and the internet as a whole. It's not the same thing. It's not legal and human rights because there are many other legal issues that need to be dealt with that are not necessarily human rights issues. I hope I'm just fired. So again, this is just an introductory session, so I don't want to confuse or, or complicate things too much today. But um, as you go through this course, I'm assuming that you would delve into these things for way more deeply and you would have those discussions um, with your various facilitators when, when that time comes. Um, but it's a very good question because of that point of where do you draw the line between legal and human rights? Okay, so can I ask for the next slide? Pedro? Yeah. I didn't see Carolyn. Carolyn, I didn't see any further clarification uh, or question. Carolyn asked if a uh, compliance is a part of internet governance. Yeah, and, and I, I don't know if you missed my, my request to clarify what that meant because compliance in terms of what? In terms of regulation, in terms of, because it's compliance is a, is a concept in IT governance, yes? But is it, what's it, what do you, what's the question related to in internet governance? So if she could just really put in the chat what, what she meant by that, uh, that question or further. Um, so I guess we can play the video now, um, Pedro. This is a, one perspective of internet governance from the U European Union's perspective. So I want, to be, want you to be very sure about that. It's not, it's not the perspective, it's the EU perspective. Go ahead, Pedro. Thank you. Okay. Yes, everyone, let me know if it's lagging or the sound isn't working. Just type it in the chat. Audio the internet, the global network of networks that changed our lives. Instant online communication between people all over the world, new business models, exchange of information, free flow and storage data are all benefits which we enjoy without thinking of the whole picture. How is it governed? Which are the major players? The internet has no centralized governance and therefore no unified rules and policies exist. In order to understand the full picture, I will tell you more about the most important stakeholders in internet governance. Ideally, they are all in dialogue with each other. Governments. Governments and national legislation authorities determine the national policies for access and use of the internet on national level. Active governments in the field have been USA, EU member states and the EU as a whole, Brazil, China, India and Russia. In 2015, the EU adopted the first EU-wide net neutrality rules, which creates individual and enforceable rights for end users to access and distribute internet content and services of their choice. Internet service providers. Internet service providers are the key online intermediaries, which provide access to the internet for end users. Internet service provider services are regulated by the national legislation of each country, which may lead to unequal treatment of internet services in different countries. Telecommunication companies. They facilitate internet traffic and run the internet infrastructure. Their primary interest in internet governance is to ensure a business-friendly global environment for the development of telecommunication e-infrastructure. Internet content companies. They can be small startups as well as very big well-known tech companies. 
Their core business models can be affected by changes in internet governance. The business priorities of these companies are closely linked to various internet governance issues, such as IP, privacy, cybersecurity, and net neutrality. The technical community created the initial spirit of the internet based on the principles of sharing resources, open access, and opposition to government involvement in internet regulation. Civil society. Civil society actively supports the multi-stakeholder approach to internet governance. The case of Max Schrems versus Facebook is an example of how the engagement of civil society in issues related to privacy and data protection can have significant impact on internet governance. I can defines policies for how the names and numbers of the internet should run and helps coordinate the domain name system as it matches domain names with appropriate IP address numbers. Internet Governance Forum The emanation of the multi-stakeholder approach is the annually organized international forum Internet Governance Forum, where people gather to discuss on public policy issues relating to internet governance, such as the internet's sustainability, robustness, security, stability and development. Cyberspace all these actors interact and regulate a small part of the cyberspace, the surface web, which comprises approximately 4% of all internet content. Beyond that, two more layers exist, the deep and the dark internet. These dimensions are considered to be a fora for illegal actions, connected with online and offline activities. So, the main challenges for internet governance is how to regulate all this space, how to prevent, investigate and mitigate cybercrimes and other forms of illegal activities enabled by the possibilities provided by the internet, how to perform these actions without intruding people's privacy or infringing their natural and fundamental human rights. All these questions are focus of the mapping project. For more information, please visit the website below. Engage.mappingtheinternet.eu All right, thank you, Pedro. So I think that gave you a, that, that's a nice segue into our next um, slides, a series of slides. Um, all right, perfect. So first of all, let me just answer Caroline's question. So uh, Caroline, so, um, so you indicated that the compliance in terms of um, understanding of compliance and internal governance, you said a set of rules that private corporations are using to regulate the internal processes, yes. So I think that's where the confusion is between what you might call IT governance or ICT governance and internet governance. So, so it's a good segue to use the fact that IT governance, generally speaking, focuses on internal, intra-organizational issues. So, so your organization, whether it be a private sector, even government organization, and how it manages its, its, its digital infrastructure. Whereas internet governance, just from its very name, internet is the, the question of the, the global internet and what the network of networks and how is that governed. So compliance in relation to the internet, to a large extent talks about, and we'll talk about it coming up, um, whether or not the the internet can be regulated or is it being regulated and whether entities like ICANN and others are able to, to deal with things like compliance of the domain name system, etc. And again, we will talk about that in a few minutes. So your, your question about internal versus ex, um, corporations would apply to IT governance and ICT governance, depending on what, what word, phrase you use. Whereas internet governance generally deals with outside of the organization, the global discussion about the internet. Okay, so as we move on now to this discussion about uh, what you sort of got hinted at in the video, the larger milieu of what this internet thing is. So I hinted at it in the, the, the first slide, I think, or the second slide, where there are many stakeholders involved in 
um, the internet. But let's just let's just concentrate on ecosystem first. So this is a very popular concept, and I think it's it's something that I, I found very useful um, in describing what this internet governance landscape looks like. So, you know, an ecosystem for those who have done, you know, biology or science, you know, at, at, at primary school or even a secondary school, is a network of interactions among things, organisms generally, and between organisms and the environment. So, if you were to look at the internet as being part of an ecosystem, it is, continues to be a successful and thriving eco, um, entity because of the way its ecosystem continues to function in an open, transparent, and collaborative manner. And I want to make sure that that's very clear. So as an example, to, if you look at what's happening today with COVID-19, so far, let's keep our fingers crossed, it that has not broken. All right, we haven't seen the internet break as we may have predicted. Now, websites may have gone down, it's a different discussion, but the internet itself, which is a network of networks that of which the World Wide Web is part of, and our mobile applications, and all of our um, uh, WhatsApp and Zoom calls, etc., all those things run on the internet, and the internet itself has not broken. As I said, sites may have gone down. Uh, you may have had disruptions in cloud infrastructure somewhere, but the internet still remains up and running as at May 16th, 2020, despite all of the increased traffic, etc. Why is that? Because of the success of this ecosystem and the way that all of its actors and organisms and stakeholders work together to ensure that it continues to, to scale and to thrive and to, to respond to challenges that is placed on it. So it's a growing, so it, it's very similar to, I guess, if you look at the cloud thinking, and everybody knows the cloud is a euphemism for the internet, it's very elastic, you know, so it tends to expand to accommodate the additional traffic um, that is happening today. So you have more services placed online for those who are technical. More, more resources being allocated to allow for more of these Zoom calls and all of these Google Meet and Skype, etc. More resources being placed towards that. And that whole discussion and, and thought process is part of an ecosystem that says, hey, world, we are now in a new situation where the internet is being called upon to do more. Let's work together. So an ISP, uh, posting provider, content provider would say, let us work together to ensure that we provide more resources to this particular application or this suite of applications or this country or this wherever, this data center, so that we can ensure that we don't um, have any issues with internet, not just for the people who are using things like Zoom, but for those who are using other tools and applications that may suffer because you're allocating additional resources to Zoom. So I'll make sure you understand that, that thought process. So the, the fact that it said works like this is not magic. It's not automatic in that sense. There are many players and many actors working behind the scenes to ensure that this thing does not break and has not yet broken um, in its you know, 30 odd years of existence. Well, 50 years if you really were to take it to the next level in the 1970s. Okay, next slide, please. So, the members and aspects of this ecosystem are all of these organizations, individuals, and processes that shape the coordination and mass of the internet. And these are very highly independent, interdependent parts that require significant coordination, i.e. internet gov governance. So just like an ecosystem, just like your, your bio systems that we have out there, 
with everything works in harmony, you know, to ensure that there's nothing disruptive and it's like a virus quite literally comes in and creates a disruption. Um, then we have a situation where everything is working in harmony in this ecosystem to ensure that it continues to stay as the, as the whole. Next slide. So, and again, I have the link in the, I know this is quite small, the next slide will be bigger, but this is to give you an example of what an ecosystem looks like in relation to the internet. So as you can see, there's a link just below that. When you get the deck, you'll see the, the link to this, 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 this graphic. And um, I want you to take a look at that, that text in the blue box that um, is just above the graphic for the, for the first part. The internet is successful in large part due to its unique model. Shared global ownership, open standards development, and freely accessible processes for technology at policy development. The internet's unprecedented success continues to thrive because the internet model is open, transparent, and collaborative. The model relies on processes and products that are local, bottom-up, and accessible to users around the world. So I want you just to, to take note of that because this is the essence of this governance discussion we're having now. It's not about a top-down, some board of directors sitting somewhere and deciding what's happening about the internet. It's a very open, transparent, um, I'm trying not to use a democratic, that's a very odd word to use, but it's a collaborative process where to, to a very large extent, policies and decisions are made by a bottom-up, multi-stakeholder process. Can I have the next slide, please, um, Pedro? Just to show you this diagram in more detail. All right, so in this diagram, and I'll show you another one after, which is another representation of this. You basically see all of the players in the ecosystem. And I don't have to read it out for you, but you can see in the center, you have the naming and addressing, open standards development, shared global services and operations, users, education and capacity building, and our local, national, regional, and global policy development um, entities. And as you move out from the center, you'll see where those functions lie. To a large extent, many of the, the, the entities you're seeing here, the stakeholders, play a role, sometimes singularly, on that area of, of responsibility, but others like governments and other uh, what we call I-STAR entities such as ICANN and ICE, Internet Society, etc., play multiple roles as it goes through its ecosystem. Um, so this is not, I mean, again, we don't have a great deal of time to go through all of this, but I, I encourage you to take a look at this, this diagram, which you have a link to it there. Um, and you'll get a sense of what, what's happening and the, the complexity involved in this governance infrastructure. And you're gonna see very closely where civil society plays a role and where you yourself may play a role as part of the internet society um, as being a member of a chapter of the larger group. Next slide, please, Pedro. This is another representation of pretty much the same thing, but uh, this is a, a very popular document because it sort of um, explains in a very short synopsis of who is doing the work and exactly where they fit in. So, and when it talks about the ISTAR organizations, if you look on the left-hand side, you'll see IAB. I can, I E T F, quite literally I, I meaning internet and then star meaning the rest of the, the name of the organization. So we have Internet Architecture Board, I can, I E T F, the IGF, which we'll get into quickly um, going forward. And on the right hand side, you see standards organizations like the ISO, um, Internet Society as ISOC, 
and the RIRs will be your regional internet registries. In the case of this region, it's LACNIC. And if you're in the Caribbean, we actually have a split between LACNIC and ARIN. Uh, ARIN takes care of one part of the Caribbean and LACNIC takes care of the other part. And standards more is like the W3C, the, World, the Web Foundation, as you might know them as. And if you look at the center of this diagram, you'll get a sense of where and how this works and the players that are involved in the multi-stakeholders, as you see there, talking about doing policy processes, um, operating in it itself, you know, so there's servers and technical aspects. And of course, there's a lot of discussion, open debate at um, things like IETF meetings, ICANN meetings, and RIR meetings like LACNIC and RN and RIPE, et cetera as well, of course, as the IGF, which we'll talk about shortly, and the IGF's offshoots, which will be things like your regional internet governance forum, so LAC IGF in this scenario, and of course, in this particular function we're in, the youth LAC IGF, which is an NRI that focuses on a youth um, entity that is looking at internet governance. So, you are playing a role today in internet governance as part of the youth lack idea just by being part of this discussion and this this education exercise and the overall lack idea you're actually playing a significant role already in internet governance in what we approach so i'll make, make sure you understand that. next slide so the domain name system is not the internet but the domain system is perhaps the most well-known aspect of the internet. What do I mean by that? This is what you may be familiar with in terms of things like Amazon.com or Google.com. It's pretty much what you, what, well, in, back in my day, you used to type things in a browser, um, address bar to get to the internet <laughs> and website. I don't know how people just use Google and search for it, but um, in my day, you would simply, you would have to type in www.something.something to get to that location. And the domain system is really an address book, to large extent, that translates numbers, which is what the internet is really made of, of an IP addressing system. So for those who are technically minded, you're familiar with the IP of your server of your computer and the domain system basically is a telephone directory if you're familiar with a telephone directory or directory of sorts that does a lookup and uses that familiar amazon.com to direct you to the correct ip address the domain system is the real technical guts of the internet over and beyond the actual servers and infrastructure. So for the internet to work as it currently does today, this DNS is where the action really is. And while the other parts of the internet that are equally as important, without the DNS, the internet will, will, will almost, um, it will be a very difficult place to function. It'll be very difficult. That link you clicked on to get to this um, meeting today is part of the DNS. That Zoom link you clicked on to get here today. Um, so whether you typed it in into your browser, whether you clicked on a link, the DNS is working to ensure that you got to this class today, this, this session today. And ICANN is part of that internet governance framework that I mentioned before, the ecosystem. And they're the, the custodians today of the DNS. And DNS is what helps to keep the internet secure, stable, and interoperable, meaning that it's functional and everybody can understand what we're doing in terms of using the internet as a, not, just a, not just bits and bytes or numbers, but also it's, it's useful and usable to many people. Next slide. Any questions so far on this? And now going a little bit, for some people this might be technical, but this is um, 
where we have to deal with next. So I know time is running out, but let me just play this, this video. So this video here is related to, this, to show you how this DNS works, but also how the governance of this DNS has been has changed since 2000 and I think 15, if I'm not mistaken. Hi, I'm Vince Cerf. I am a father of three children, David and Bennett, and, well, the internet. And like any good father, I'm going to bend your ear with a story about my kid. When the internet was in its infancy, it was small and easy to deal with. It was a U.S. Defense Department project managed by Bob Kahn and me. Back in the early days, my friend John Postel managed the directory that translates between names like Google.com and IP addresses. To go to a site, you type the name and hit enter, similar to the way you do now. After you hit enter, in milliseconds, the letters you type were translated into a series of numbers called Internet Protocol Addresses. They're like street numbers, and they direct you to the website's physical location on the Internet. But the demand for new names and addresses grew much higher. And in 1998, at the urging of the White House, leaders in the Internet community created a nonprofit, multi stakeholder global group called ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. Its job is to coordinate and issue IP addresses and domain names, among other critical functions. Although ICANN is a nonprofit organization, its governance is provided by a broad set of actors governments, engineers, companies, and ordinary users who all have a seat at the table. There's been some confusion about the United States' role in creating ICANN. Oversight of ICANN was assigned to the NTIA. IP address allocations are made by ICANN to five regional registries. It's because of this decentralized approach that the U.S. primary role has decreased. And recently, NTIA has presented a plan to end its contractual oversight and hand that responsibility over to ICANN. The U.S. government has been clear that in order for the NTIA transition to go through, non-governmental management of the Internet must continue. So the U.S. isn't giving away its authority and evil superpowers aren't taking over in response. Instead, the U.S. government is completing its long-standing commitment to place control of the domain name and Internet address structure into the hands of an international, multi-stakeholder community. To sum it all up, the purity of your internet experience will stay the same. The only thing that's changing is that we're achieving an even more democratic framework so the internet can remain free and open. Hi, uh, thank you, Pedro. So that, that video, as you can tell, was a the US centric video that was developed in response to the criticisms that when the, for those who may have heard of this, when the IANA, I don't want to come against the acronym SUPER, but the, the organization that basically took, well, oversaw the numbering function of the internet, IANA and the naming functioning, which was um, ICANN, the US government had final oversight of that function. And there was a commitment of the US government to, to shift this away from the United States to the global community. Um, so it's not just you know countries who are powerful or countries who are uh, uh, large but also but everybody uh, and that will be reside generally in the ICANN community that there was a protest or a large groundswell of negative opinion in the United States that it was being handed over to you know to you know I don't want to name countries names here but you know country X and country Y and the US is giving up its its um, you know internet power as the case may be so that video was coming from that perspective to show that um, I think quite helpfully that the transition from what would have been a U.S. government oversight to a, a multi-stakeholder community was the, the thrust and in fact has happened. 
And that's what's happening today. And that's what ICANN is um, doing today. And we have ICANN and something called the PTI, which is, um, which is originally called the Post Transition IANA. It's really um, technical identifiers. Uh, I forget the first, what the P stands for, but it's, it's um, the PTI board, which is taking care of it today. And as I can stakeholders for those who have been involved in ICANN meetings. Oh, wait, I think Tracy, yes. oh, Chris is back. Yes, I was saying that, um, I don't know where you lost me, but I was saying that there are many people who are involved in ICANN uh, um, who might be on this call today, um, but I know that Pedro and, um, and Eileen and others would have been part within ICANN meetings um, over some period of time. Uh, so they can also explain to you what being part of that ICANN infrastructure, that ICANN ecosystem looks like. And you do have a, a say as a, as a user or as a um, participant in that community through various, and this is not the, the place and time to go into everything in ICANN, but certainly um, I want to I encourage you to explore it further. Um, so I, I think that this, this section here about understand further, I think is important. Um, I provide links to understand what the uh, internet governance framework looks like. Um, there's a, a many sites that ISOC has. There's a policy brief that's written in 2015. The Plo Foundation has um, an, an entire YouTube playlist from 2008. It's, it's, a little, it's a little old, but it's still useful. You can take a look at. And this uh, very popular publication by Dr. Jovan um, Kura, Kurabilia is published currently in English, Spanish, and French. There is a Portuguese version of it, but it's an old edition. Um, so um, if you go to this, these sites, you will get to the the various um, languages, but you can get the Portuguese version for those who um, speak Portuguese, but you get an old edition of it. And of course, there's a, a acronym soup <laughs> playbook right after that. Next slide, please. I just want to make sure we just, just show this internet governance forum thing. All right, so I know we don't have time for this, but I just want to make sure, can you just move forward um, one slide, Pedro? So you will get the slides after this meeting. Um, I, I believe that's, that's something that um, you're asking, but you are part, I just want to make sure I want to end these kinds of thoughts. You are part of this process. And if the ICANN process, which I just sort of tried to go through there, not making it too, too technical, may seem technical for some of you or may seem a little bit much, then you have this IGF process, which is significantly less technical and covers, if you remember the first um, cartoon we showed the diagram, all those baskets or levels of that building, it looks at all of those, um, you know, legal and, and human rights issues, etc. And the IGF is not just an event. The IGF is a forum, as you see on the slide, for, for, for multi-stakeholder policy dialogue on internet governance issues, such as the internet sustainability, robustness, security, stability, and development. Now, the IGF is a process. It started in 2005, six thereabouts, with the, a meeting in, in um, Tunis, and the first physical meeting that was held was held in 2006 in, I believe it was Athens or was it Brazil? I can't recall this point in time, but I have a list. There's a list in this in the slide deck, you'll see it. And there've been an annual meeting ever since somewhere in the world. Um, and people on this, and Pedro and Eileen have gone to one of those meetings at least, if not more than one. And they can share with you, as well as, as, well as other members of this um, youth thing, of what the IGF actually involves. But the IGF, as I said, is a process, a process. It's not about the physical event that you have. As a matter of fact, this year's IGF may not even be 
a physical event, right? As we, as we look at the possibility of it shifting to virtual, but nonetheless, um, it'll be held in Poland um, in November 2020, if all goes well, if not well, you'll likely see a virtual event. But the process of getting to an IGF is made of these, all these other as aspects of which you are currently a part of. So I mentioned that you're part of this youth lack IGF. This is a process that is an input into the wider IGF process. So it should work like you are the youth lack IGF, you feed into your um, regional IGF, which is the lack IGF. So you feed up to the lack IGF and also to your country IGFs or country youth IGFs. So in the LAC region, in Central America, the Caribbean, South America, each country may or may not have their own IGFs or um, youth IGFs even. You will also be feeding your, your learning and your conversations in both directions. And they're not, one is not bigger than the other, one is not more powerful than the other. Because in the regional and the country IGFs or national IGFs, you tend to have issues that are very relevant to your country or to your region on the regional side. Whereas if you go to the global IGF, the global IGF process, they're dealing with glo more global issues that are, may not necessarily involve an issue that's happening, let's say in Guatemala or somewhere in Antigua in the Caribbean or probably in um, Uruguay, who knows. So you are, you're dealing with issues that are related to your particular context and I want to encourage each of you, uh, as you, as you wind this up, I know time is against us, to take a look at participating in the IGF process, not just from the standpoint of going physically to a meeting that's held once a year, whether it be even in the youth, at the youth process that you're doing now, but also participating in the, the forum, the IGF processes that happen, what we, the term we use in English is intersessionally, so between events, there's a lot of activity that's happening. Um, so your youth seg will be hopefully organizing activities in relation to internet governance throughout any given year that may culminate in an event like this as we have now, Youth Lack Idea 2020, or events that may happen in between, or webinars that may happen in between or whatever. And I want to ensure everybody here really participates fully in the IGF process because without you, the process cannot continue. Without youth, I mean, you're young now, the process can't function without you. And when you transition from being youth into the next stage, you know, adults, I guess let's call it adults for argument's sake. I mean, I know all of you are also adults, but uh, senior, maybe senior as the expert years, then you have graduated, so to speak, from this youth discussion, but with the experience of talking about the issues amongst the youth and being able to take that forward and let the internet governance structure and process keep regenerating itself. Think about mentoring others coming up um, in, your, in your schools, in your, at, you know, in your families, and participating in this process. The more people who are involved, the more people who participate in the process, the more likely we are to have a stronger, more resilient internet going forward. And I want to leave you with that. As I said, these slides are, um, there are more slides in this presentation, but let's talk about the IGF in general. And there's some videos that you can watch about what the IGF means, but I just, I just want to summarize that um, as we wrap this up and open the floor for any questions that you may have, any thoughts that you may want to add right now to the discussion. So thanks, Pedro. Um, as I said, you, you should have this, the rest of the slides. There are a few more slides after this, but I think, I think it's good to stop here and probably see where the, the questions are at now today. Okay. So if anyone has a question about uh, the, the presentation or anything about the course as well, please, you can unmute yourself and then say it or you can also type in the chat let me just check if anyone has written something in the chat before 
maybe I could ask if someone um, thinks this was useful at all. Did, did, do, does anybody have any better understanding of the, the process after this, you know, one hour or so we spent together? Maybe I could ask that question first and see if anyone wants to, to weigh in, you know, in the, don't be shy. Well, if any, uh, if no one has a question for now, I'll have one. Uh, Tracy, could you talk to us about the youth programs, some of the youth pro programs, just an overview uh, to participate in the IGEP, such as the Youth Ambassadors or maybe the uh, uh, Youth Brazil that CGI organized here, just to have people can have an idea uh, as ways that they can enter in this ecosystem and participate more actively. All right, thank you. So, Pietria, so there are many, many, many avenues to get involved in the internet governance uh, ecosystem, you know. Um, in within your region, you can start, I mean, depending on where you come from. So if you're coming from a technical standpoint, um, for example, you have the LACNIC um, meetings that tend to happen. I mean, and right now they're all virtual, but they also happen around the region, they move around and they offer fellowships. Uh, partial fellowships where you can participate. Um, they can, they'll pay for you to fly to a country or to, if you pay for the tickets, you can stay somewhere. Um, so you get in from that angle. The LAC IGF also has um, opportunities if, it, you know, if you want to travel to somewhere, but also you can pass it fully virtually. And as you go through the system, there's also, as I said, the ICANN environment where you can participate um, through ICANN fellowships and at the IGF plural, well, the IGF plural meaning the various IGFs around the world, um, you can participate in all of them because they're all open. And from the global IGF standpoint, there is, as Pedro was, was um, motivating me to speak about, there are several avenues that you can participate in as a young person. The primary avenue that um, is currently available is the one that is offered through Internet Society or ISOC. And depending on what happens, I guess, this year, every year they will put out a call for um, youth to participate in the Youth Ambassador Program, the IGF Ambassador. It's no longer called Youth, but it's called ITF Ambassador Program. And, but it's designed for youth primarily, and you will be able to be trained as well. There's a training program, and once you complete that, including there's a series of webinars that will happen thereafter. Um, the ones who do the best, you know, the most successful, um, can earn themselves a physical trip to participate in the IGF and, and several of the group um, have participated in just up to last year in Berlin. I, I, I was happy to see many of the, the youth um, in our region participating in Berlin. Um, 2016, there were many of us in, in Guadalajara, Mexico, uh, where I believe all of this really got, got really started. And I know that CGI, as, as Pedro in CGI in Brazil, has a program that may also offer um, support for people who like to participate in the IGF and other processes directly uh, if you um, apply to them. Um, I know that they offer stuff for people from Brazil, but they also do a lot of work throughout the region and it'll be something you want to explore as well. Let me see, there are a few questions popping in, well, quite a few comments popping in here. Um, Eduardo is asked if access is the only thing that is missing for internet to be democratic. What do you think is missing? So Eduardo, that's a, you know, that's a, that's a very complicated question. Um, well, first of all, the word democratic is, I, think, I don't know if that's a language um, challenge there, but it, it's, if you mean accessible for all, um, so it's, you know, everybody gets equal or access to the internet, that's, 
it's a huge issue. It's not simply about um, um, access, you know, it's about training individuals, about sustaining that access, and it's about getting meaningful access. So there's been a huge debate in the world about whether, um, you know, there's one platform, I don't name Facebook, which offers access um, for free throughout, you know, throughout many countries in the world on mobile platforms. Is that access meaningful and, and sufficient for people to use, or is it that they want to access the whole internet, et cetera, et cetera? So there's a, there's a huge debate around that. So that's a, that's a very complicated question you're asking, and I think that's the subject almost of a separate <laughs> A separate webinar, but it's not the only thing that's missing. You need many other aspects of it to become fully meaningful, if that's the word to use, or, or equitable. So if I'm accessing it living in a city, and how can I make that access be similar to or equal to someone who's living in a, a, a very small village somewhere that has very little electricity, or water and so on. That's a very different question to ask and a very different solution you may have to provide. Okay. How can I access this platform? That's I saw questions. Okay. Benjamin is asking, what do you think is a path for the continued identification of thematic areas that deserve to be covered by internet governance? What do you think is a path for the continued identification of thematic areas? So one way that's done, and I, I mean, I know we don't have time to show these videos that uh, I have prepared, which is a video that was done by the Berlin, um, and you can take a look at it um, after we finish today, of how the IGF in 2019 was, was structured. The, the organizers, and they, they, they do it every year actually, so it's not just Berlin. Uh, had a call for submissions and these thematic areas that um, were chosen by a multi-stakeholder group were based on that call so people they asked the world for those who were paying attention what should we discuss in 2019 and people submitted and they and then a committee got together and chose a committee a multi-stakeholder representational committee chose the themes and then after that, and the themes were very broad. It wasn't like it was very limited in themes. People submitted workshops and, and sessions based around those themes. And as an example, there was, a, I believe, there's still an area called Emerging Issues, which is as broad as you can get. It's anything. So we've had, uh, just to give you some insight of what, what the IGF has discussed, um, we've discussed dying on the internet, quite literally. How do you, even before it became a, a topic of conversation, if you die, what happens to you? To you, yeah. but, I mean, that's a whole, it's a very interesting session if you can find it on YouTube. Well. Yeah, I think I, I, think I, I lost, I came, I'm back. Yes. So I was saying that, um, are you hearing me okay now? Yeah, yeah. All right, so I was just saying, I don't know where you lost me, I was saying that there are many, interesting sessions that people propose and you're free to do the same but just to answer your question to keep the the the, the thematic thrust you know the the evolution of the internet so if you're talking about 5g that's what and that was discussed years ago at the igf so it's i know it's new now for, for many people but it was discussed many many moons ago um, that's why people who laugh at laugh at the the, the situation now we're facing now but uh, it's just separate part from that. What's happening next is always what the IGF is always coming up with, and I think that's important, as well as discussing the issues that are still relevant today. Um, community networks, network neutrality, access and inclusion, um, you know, the, all the issues that you would imagine that would be important for people who are in our part of the world are still being discussed at things like the IGF. Um, they may not be as discussed as much at IGFs in the United States or in Europe, but they're being discussed certainly at a global IGF and in many cases even at our regional and 
national ITF structures. I can't, because I've lost the connection, I can't see the, any other questions. Pedro, are there any other questions? Let me check here, but I think this is, no, this is the, the last one. All right, so I've, are there any other, I don't hear, still haven't heard anybody come in with anything um, verbal, very shy, but I thank you for the two text questions that came in. Does anybody want to ask anything else? That's weird. Um, yes, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. go ahead. Um, my question is, uh, what are the biggest challenges in managing the resources for the internet? And how can we meet those challenges? Right, thank you, Stanley, for that question. Um, I remember doing a, a session at an ITF in 2015 about the, what we call the free internet. I had been surfing the session and the question was asked you know, is can the internet ever be free and the, somebody and the question that came back well the, the answer that came back was somebody has to pay for something so if you are hearing about expansion of the internet increased resources i mentioned it i think earlier in the discussion about you know this COVID 19 situation where the internet had to expand someone is paying for it. So the question you're asking is, is, is how can we continue that expansion? Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending how you look at it, that will come by increased investment on the one hand, increased um, or better technology to make things more efficient, some better connectivity, better ways of using fiber optics, etc., etc. But at the end of the day, you will see your internet bills, your bandwidth bills, your whatever go is going up. And there's a whole debate in the ITU, which is another I star that I didn't mention because deliberately so, where because voice revenue is decreasing, as people using the, the, your phone, the mobile phones to call people and landlines to call people, their revenue generated there normally. The revenue is now going to other technologies like you know, WhatsApp and uh, Viber and Telegram, etc. And that revenue, which was normally all, uh, caught in a, a situation where I'm charging you per minute for a voice call, is now caught in data and no one can trap what you're spending on voice, etc. So what you're starting to see, and I think many of you are seeing it, is that the less you use voice, the more your internet bill is going to start to increase. Or what you're also seeing perhaps is maybe increased packages. So you're gonna get better packages, but pay more for it. And that's a, a subtle way of raising the, raising the rate. So short answer to your question, Stan, is that we have to pay for it. This is the money coming from to continue investing in, the, in in this expansion and, and additional resourcing. It's coming from us as the end user, as the user of the internet, and that's, that's not a, it's an untrue statement. But of course, the private sector invests as well, and you do have philanthropy from you know, other organizations. Um, but to a large extent, we're gonna have to be paying for the expansion of this internet as we see it today and tomorrow. So while you may pay less for your mobile bill, less for your calls, you got to transfer that, um, that money to, or, or paying less for cable is another issue where, where people who don't have to pay for cable, um, transfer to data. And you're going to start to see increased costs being allocated for your data bills, et cetera. Did that answer your question, Stanley, or do you want another direction to take? Well, thank you for your answers. I, I think everything is okay right. now. I hope I answered it. Yeah. <laughs> is there anything else? All right, so I hope, let me see, Lucas, Julia, Eduarda, Nubia, Flavio, Marina, Nathan, Thais, Benjamin, Elise, Giovanna, Nathaniel, Paola, hi Paola. 
um, Stanley, well, I think something shifted there, but uh, I don't know if I missed anyone. Eileen, hi Eileen, um, Nathan, Benjamin, Marina, did I call you guys already? Anyhow, so thanks all for attending. I appreciate your time and your attention. You've been a good audience. Uh, thanks for your questions. Um, I hope you um, enjoyed it. I hope you found it interesting. And I hope you find the slides that you're going to get to be useful. I really appreciate your, your time. And thank you, um, YouthSeg, for inviting me to, to present. Thanks, Pao, um, Pedro, and thanks, Eileen. I appreciate it. And I hope that all went well, um, except for the one or two internet. You know, as I said earlier, this is my, we're now at peak internet usage in my country. It's Netflix, Netflix and chill time. So everybody's using the internet in my neighborhood. So that's going to be it. it. <laughs> I'm, I'm lucky I survived this long with the, without cutting out too much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. So, uh, um, so Pedro, back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy. We are really grateful for your time and knowledge on all these topics. Um, I would also like to talk a little bit of the Youth Ambassadors experience, but we are going to share a uh, small text on the platform so you can see how it works, um, what you can do to participate, what, uh, what are the things that you should start doing by now so you can get better chances of being selected as the final phase. And, uh, we are just about our cap, our uh, time limit here. So I will thank everyone for participating and see you next week. Any doubts, any suggestions, anything you need to say, just contact me or contact anyone from the Youth Like IJF organization and see ya. <laughs>